Now we're going to extend the thermodynamic analysis now to two components. So let's draw a picture there. Picture's worth a thousand words. Okay, so here's our box. We'll have component one, which is an equilibrium in the liquid. Here's component one in the gas phase. We'll now have a second component, which is a liquid down here. This will also be an equilibrium with component two in the gas phase. So what we have now with these two components is that the chemical potential of one in the liquid phase is equal to the chemical potential of one in the gas phase. That's at equilibrium. This, by the way, is at phase equilibrium. And chemical potential component two in the liquid phase will be equal to the chemical potential component two in the gas phase. That's what we mean by phase equilibrium. Well, just let's go ahead and put some expressions in here. So uh, let's just do it uh, first for the component one. So the chemical potential component one, and let's just do the liquid phase here. In the liquid phase, that'll be the chemical potential of one in the liquid phase, standard state, plus RT times the natural log of the activity of one in the liquid phase. Now for a pure component, the activity was one. But now since we have two components, the activity in the liquid phase is no longer one. And then the chemical potential of one in the gas phase is a chemical potential of one in the gas phase at the standard state plus RT times the natural log of the activity, but just let's go ahead and assume we have ideal solutions and so on, the pressure divided by the standard state pressure. Now this is no longer the, st the pressure of the pure component. Why? Well, it's not a pure component anymore. We have two components. So this differs from what we developed before. However, we do know that the chemical potential of the standard state chemical potentials of the liquid is the standard state chemical potential of the gas plus this. So this is for standard states here, and this is a pure substance. So we can go ahead and substitute in for this a standard state chemical potential of the liquid into there. And then, of course, at phase equilibrium, we're going to equate these. So let me go ahead and substitute in for there what well, we had the expression on the other one so that the chemical potential of the liquid in standard state is the chemical potential of component one in standard state plus RT times the natural log of the pressure of one, pure one, vapor pressure of pure substance divided by standard state plus RT times the natural log of the activity of one in the liquid state. So we just substitute in what the standard state for one liquid was. That's what that was. That is equal to the standard state chemical potential uh, of one in the gas phase plus RT times the natural log of the pressure in the mixture, not the pure substance, but the mixture divided by the standard state. How convenient these cancel out. Let's put, let's see, let's put, uh, I'll put this term over there. So we have RT times the natural log of the activity of one in the liquid phase is equal to RT times the natural log. Let's see, I have this one and I'm subtracting this one. So it'll be P1 over P1, uh, sorry, P0. That's what that is, but when I subtract that, that will go down in the a denominator. So this would be P1 star divided by P0. All well, the P0s cancel out. So this is just equal to RT times the natural log of the pressure above the solution in the mixture divided by the pressure above the solution in the pure, pure state. That's the star there. And if RT log of A equals RT log of this, this implies that the activity of substance one in the liquid phase is equal to the pressure of one divided by the pressure of one if it were pure. So if you have pure substance, the vapor pressure, uh, the pressures here would be equal, the activity be one for a pure liquid. And if you have less than a um, 100%, if you have less than pure substance, you dilute it out by adding something else and the vapor pressure goes down and the activity will go down just by this ratio. Or let's rewrite this. So remember, we said that the activity of a liquid can be written as the activity coefficient. Let's say, let's continue using 
say, component 1. So let's say the activity of component 1 in the liquid phase is equal to the activity of component 1 times the mole fraction of component 1 in the liquid phase. So this is mole fraction, it's concentration unit of component 1 in the liquid phase. Let's assume that gamma 1 is equal to 1, so we have an ideal solution. So the activity of component 1 in the liquid phase is just the mole fraction of 1. And we use x for mole fraction in the liquid phase a little while long, a little while long. Along in this lecture, we use y for mole fraction in the vapor phase. So this is the liquid phase. So if that's true, okay, look at this. We can just replace that. So the mole fraction of 1 is equal to the pressure of 1 above the solution, which has two components, divided by the vapor pressure of pure A, or pure component 1. And this is the actual pressure, a uh, pressure in, above mixture. So what does this mean? This means the, this is a solution concentration. The solution concentration, mole fraction, governs the ratio of the vapor phase, the uh, pressure, the partial, or the fraction of pressure in the vapor phase. Or another way to, to write that is that the pressure above a solution is equal to the mole fraction in the solution times the vapor pressure up here. This is known as Raoult's law. And usually that is just given to you in introductory chemistry, but here we derived it using the fact that we had phase equilibrium. Well, that's kind of neat. So let's go touch base with our slides here. So where are we? Uh, yeah, so for two uh, liquids, each having a vapor pressure, so the fig I'll show you the figure in the next slide, we have Raoult's law. Okay, so just let's look at this. Let's go a little bit further. Let's go where no person has gone before, except a million other people who have studied PCAM. Let's assume we have ideal gases, so we can use Dalton's law. So Dalton's law says the total pressure in a mixture of gases is equal to the partial pressures, and we just have two components, so it'll be the partial pressure of component one plus the partial pressure of component two. That's okay for ideal gases. So we know that the partial pressure of component 1 is the mole fraction times the vapor pressure of pure component 1. And you could just go through the same derivation and substitute 1 or 2 for 1, and you get this, the mole fraction of 2 times the vapor pressure of pure 2. So you know anything we did here for 1, just change a 2 and you'll get the exact same thing. We know that the mole fraction of 1 plus the mole fraction of 2 will equal 1. So let's get rid of mole fraction 2. Mole fraction 2 is 1 minus mole fraction 1. So the total pressure can be written as mole fraction 1 times the vapor pressure of pure 1 plus 1 minus the mole fraction of 1 times the vapor pressure of pure 2. Or the total pressure is equal to the mole fraction, or sorry, the partial of uh, the vapor pressure of pure 1 minus the vapor pressure of pure 2 times the mole fraction of component 1 plus the vapor pressure of pure 2. So look, if you plot total pressure versus mole fraction 1, you should get a straight line, and we'll see that in just a minute. And if you plot the individual pressures, like the pressure of 1 versus mole fraction of 1, you'll get a straight line. And those kinds of straight lines that you get when you do those plots, if they are straight lines, then the solution follows Raoult's law. Okay, so let's take a, a look at a, a plot of those things. Here we have a, a plot of Raoult's law. Notice they're all straight lines. What we're plotting here is vapor pressure of A or B in the solution as a function, and this we're changing notation here, sorry, I should have got another graph. Uh, a and B correspond to components 1 and 2 that we had in our derivations. But what you're doing is plotting here vapor pressure of A or B as a function of concentration of B or concentration of A. Note that A plus B, since there are only two components, they have to add to 1. Let's look at this. Here we have total pressure and as we predicted, the total pressure is a linear function of the mole fraction. So here's the mole fraction of B goes from 0 to 1. 
there's that linear function that's total pressure. Let's look at individual partial pressures. Individual partial pressures just are linear, proportional actually with the proportionality constant mole fraction. So just let's take a look at that. So these are the individual pressures. Yeah, they're linear also. So when you see a plot like this, you'd say that the mixture you're looking at, uh, the two liquid components, both of which have uh, contribute to the vapor pressure above the solution, they follow Raoult's law. Here we have uh, the mole fraction of B is zero, and the mole fraction of A is one. So here you have pure A. And out here, where the mole fraction of B is one, here you have pure B. And this starts at zero. So when you have a pure A, you have no B, so the line of B starts at zero. And you have pure A, so this will be the vapor pressure of pure A, which in our notation you put a little star up there. So there's a vapor pressure pure A. As you increase the concentration of B and decrease the concentration of A, the pressure of A decreases linearly all the way down to zero, where you don't have any more A and all B. And the pressure of B, which started at zero when you didn't have any, will linearly increase all the way up to the partial pressure of B, or the vapor pressure of pure B. That's our star there. So that's uh, how you would read a Root's Law kind of plot. So that's Raoult's Law. Raoult's Law says that the total pressure above a solution or the partial pressure of each component above the solution is linearly related to the mole fraction in the solution. So the vapor pressure above the solution is controlled by how much of that component is in the solution. What we're going to do in the next part of this lecture is to generalize this idea and plot not only pressure versus composition in the liquid phase, but also develop an expression for pressure versus concentration in the vapor phase.